Lift up your hands and give Jesus a mighty shout of praise. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's such a great honor to have all of you. Praise God. You look wonderful from here. Uh, this is Sunday. Best, Sunday best. We used to call it. Hallelujah. We'll be reading the book of Matthew chapter 5. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. If you opened your Bibles. I know we have a Bible on the screen, but it's also good for you to open yours and to underline yours and to mark yours so that you can continue to read from the house. Uh, it's called the Beatitudes. We'll be reading Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Right. Can you use this and read verse 1? Seeing the multitudes, his disciples, the he there is, who is he? Yeah, it's good to know. Then, opened his mouth the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 Blessed mm, 5 Five. We are going all the way to 11, verse 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek. Verse 5. Blessed, for they shall... Mm -hmm. Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be... Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mass. Uh, verse 8. See why it's good to carry yours also sometimes. Eh? Blessed are the pure in heart. Uh -huh. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11. Uh, you see why it's good to carry yours. Eh? Sometimes that guy can, can uh, just decide to relax so that he sees if you can read yours. And that's a good thing. Maybe one day they should go on strike just for the Bible part so that the Christians can learn to read their Bibles. Uh, the, Jesus was ascended up the mountain. He said he, when he saw the multitudes, he went up the mountain and sat down and the disciples came to him and he started to teach them. See, he was teaching his disciples. So the Sermon on the Mountain is one of the longest discourses of Jesus because he has five preachings in the book of Matthew. One of them is the Sermon on the Mountain, which is the longest, from verse 5, chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is just teaching. You can still get the, that, that in Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 17 to verse 49. He's talking about uh, this but him is talking about the five blesseds and the five wo the four woes. Who unto who are those or blessed are those? And you find the common denominator in all of them. Uh, either it is those who hunger and thirst, those who are persecuted, those who are show mercy and are merciful, and those who are meek. There's some similarities, but there's also some differences. 
Before we understand what Jesus is speaking about or teaching his disciples, you'd notice from your, your Bible that it's divided many times. The Beatitudes run from Matthew chapter 1 to Matthew chapter, sorry, Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 to 12 is the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the poor for the kingdom of God is theirs. Like that. And then from verse 13 to verse 16 is talking about the salt and the light. It says you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And that light, when it is lit, is not hidden under a bed or something, but it is put on top of the mount so that everyone can see it. It's talking about, and then it's interpretation of the law. You've been heard, it has been said, but I say. It has been said, but I say. Meaning is a new interpretation of the law. Now you notice when Matthew is writing, to the Jews, he's writing actually to the Jews. This book is primarily to the Jews because the Jews are waiting for the manifestation of the Messiah. If you read from verse 1, uh, Matthew tries to pick up the genealogy of Jesus, traces it back to Abraham because they knew, you remember every time they talked about, to Jesus about themselves, they say we are sons of Abraham. So they prided themselves in understanding that they were sons of Abraham. And they came from Abraham. And Matthew traces that back to Abraham, showing that Jesus is the expected Messiah. When you read Ma, uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9, you see, you see that a son uh, has been given to us. And a child is born. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And the kingdom of this world shall be upon his shoulders. So the Jews at this time are waiting for this coming king. It is important to notice why the king are anxious, the Jews are anxious for the coming of the Messiah. Because they are under oppression of the Roman Empire. These people have come from exile. Remember, they have had a journey of being exiled by the Babylonians, the Persians. And now they have come home. But when they come home, they are still under Roman rule, which is represented by Iron Fist. It was a very strong rule. And because of that oppression, they are waiting for a king. Because the prophets prophesied that a king is going to come. So they expect this guy to come, a king who is going to overturn uh, the rulership of the Roman Empire and put them in church. So they are looking for that independence, as it were. They are looking for that. So Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience looking for the coming of the Messiah. They do not believe it. But Matthew wants to demonstrate that Jesus is that expected Messiah that was promised by the prophets. You'll find the writers of the Gospels are dealing with different aspects of the Messiah or Jesus Christ because when Luke writes about Jesus, in fact, when Luke writes about the genealogy of Jesus, he traces it back all the way to Adam, meaning that Jesus the, uh, Luke wants to demonstrate Jesus as the son of man. He that is among us. Do You know, Luke was a doctor. So when he's explaining, uh, for example, ailments and the troubles people are going through, he takes details in explaining what they are going through. Amen? Are we together? So, so G, uh, Matthew is, the tax collector, is writing to the Jews, explaining to them that we are waiting for no other Messiah. This is the guy that was promised by the prophets that is going to come, and Messiah has come. But to do that, you realize Matthew takes the journey of Jesus just like to shadow the journey of Moses, because Moses, the Jews believe that Moses was a great prophet, and there was no, no one greater than Moses. But G Jesus, Matthew demonstrates that he's greater than Moses. That's why he uses the same journey. You'll find that he's born, then he's baptized, if you read um, Matthew chapter 3, 18 and onwards, he's baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon him, him in form of a dove, the Holy Spirit in form of a dove and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. 
And the writer of the book, uh, the books in the New Testament tells us that the uh, Israelites were the same way baptized under the Red Sea when they were going across, they were baptized because the waters were parted. So Jesus is the same way baptized and then comes at the foot of Sinai. When Moses came at the foot of Sinai, he gave the law. So Jesus comes on the mountain to give the new law in the new covenant. So he goes to the mountain and the disciples come around him and he starts to teach them. He's giving them the law because if you read, he's just repeating the Ten Commandments. But what Jesus does is that he gives them a new interpretation of what the law is. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. The Bible tells us that Jesus did not come to abolish or to do away with the law. Maybe you can give us that. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. I came to fulfill the law. Meaning that now in the new dispensation where we live today, uh, the law is not just a set of rules and regulations. The law is a person. That what was... Uh, given as laws in the Old Testament has come in the form of man, isn't it? He says the word became flesh, isn't it? That's what John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's not the rules and regulations that are put on a board, no. It's a person that we relate to. So the law has become flesh, and we can now relate with the law. So he got, comes and gives the commandments, but he also contra, contrasts the kind of law that Moses carried with the type of law that he's giving. Remember when Moses came to give the law, it was a scary sight. No one would approach the mountain. You remember? Or if you read, you remember. If you haven't read... Uh, <laughs> You can't, you can't remember if, if you have read brothers and sisters. If you haven't read, you remember. If you, haven't, if you read you, you remember. If you haven't, you hear us say about it. Okay? So it was a scary sight. When Moses came down to bring the law, it was a scary sight. No one would move near him. But Jesus tells us that when he goes up the mountain, people gather around him. Meaning we live in a place where now the gospel or the law has become friendly to us. We can approach. It's not a distant God, isn't it? God among us. He says, a son shall be born among you. His name shall be called Emmanuel. Meaning God. God with us means among us. We can relate with him. We can talk to him. We can commune with him. It's not for a chosen few, but it's for all that choose. If you choose to communicate with him and be close with him, he becomes close to you. Hallelujah. So he sits at the mountain and then disciples gather around him and the multitudes, oh, the multitude love Jesus. They come and sit and talk to him and he opens his mouth. The Bible says he opened his mouth and began to teach them. But what was he teaching them? He was teaching them, number one, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of look, the first word that comes out of his mouth is that you are blessed. See, most of us think that we live under curse. Most of us are fighting something. Most of us are born thinking that we are, something is against us. See, it's interesting. Uh, I talk to Christians usually when they come to church, maybe they seek for a pastor's help. And when they start narrating their story, it's like, you know, this happened and this happened. And I know that this spirit is against me. Uh, most people think that something is always against them. Hmm? They did not just trip and fall. Uh, it cannot be. It cannot, <laughs> it cannot just be that you tripped and fell. Somebody must be against you. you especially your neighbors. Yeah? <laughs> and you see, that is the morning that your neighbor wakes up in the wrong mood and then doesn't greet you. You see? So, you see? Yeah? <laughs> we have given people too much power over our lives. So someone or something 
must be against. You know, that conductor cannot just go without returning change, giving you change. It must be something. Because you left home and your neighbor didn't greet you, isn't it? So he must have communicated even to the conductor. <laughs> so a curse is upon us. We believe a curse is upon us. That's why it's very important that what the first thing that comes out of Jesus' teaching is that you are blessed. But the kind of blessing that God or Jesus teaches us is, oh, is contrary to the world's perception or philosophy of blessing. Because imagine if Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. That's a contradiction, isn't it? He says, blessed are the poor. Ah, in the world we don't believe that. How do you say you are blessed? When somebody stands here and says, I am blessed, what does that mean? Huh? Can you stand here without fear and say, I am blessed? People will be looking at you and saying, yeah. Brother, we need to check your definition. Hmm? But Jesus says, you are blessed. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Huh? But people who come to church and they are persecuted don't say, brother, uh, thank God with me, I am blessed. No. They say, I am going through something. Stand with me. Isn't it? <laughs> because we don't want to go through anything that is contrary. And the first thing that when you are praying, when you are standing with such kind of a person, which kind of prayers do you pray? God shall remove that cup, isn't it? By fire. Remove but Jesus says, blessed are the poor. That is so powerful because the audience here understood what Jesus was talking about. Because the children of Israel were taken in captivity. But if you read the, the letters or the prophets, every time they were taken to captivity, you find like Daniel, for example, were taken to Babylon. But when they were taken, you find a few young men were chosen who were good looking to serve at the temple. And they were castrated because there you are not supposed to give birth, isn't it? You remain like that forever. So to remain in a good, good shape to serve the king and to learn the, the philosophy of the king's palace, these were people who were taken from captivity, but among them a few people were chosen so that they can serve the palace. But not everybody was taken in into captivity. Because the captors used to look at the people and choose among them the people who were good looking. The people who were able to add value. So among the Israelites also, there are people who are left in Israel. Saying, you, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you will not uh, be of help. <laughs> so just remain. Okay. So the people who remained in Israel were looking at themselves and saying, I wish I was a captive. Hmm? I wish I was taken. Because it was not a good thing to be free then. I would imagine people who remain in Israel and are looking at themselves and saying, ah, at a holy back. <laughs> yeah? So what was your deficiency? Hmm? What did, did you lack? So the people who remained, it was not a good sight. So these are guys that Jesus is talking to and saying, blessed are the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Meaning, don't look down upon yourself anymore. I'm preparing you a better kingdom. I'm preparing you a more glorious kingdom. Because they looked upon the, down upon themselves and said, hey, you see, it is a good thing to, it, it is hurtful for you to be number three or four in an interview when they are looking for two people or one person, isn't it? You go home and say, uh, they call you, for example, and you, you get to learn that you are number three, but they took the first two. Say, what? Well, maybe next time. I was beaten by two or three points, maybe next time. But it's more terrible to find that you are the topmost candidate, but they are not willing to take you. Hmm? So you, are, you talked in the interview, but they say we re-advertise, meaning we didn't get someone. <laughs> uh -huh. They say the next three or four months we are re-advertising, meaning that the company is even better to have no one than to have you. Uh -huh. 
we would rather, <laughs> would, you see, I used to have a boss that used to suck people very politely. He says, it's going to be very difficult to continue without you. But from Monday, we are going to try. <laughs> In fact, you go home thanking him. You know, he sucks you very well until you, you thank you, sir. Thank you. You are happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we have attended a couple of um, ma ma uh, marriage negotiations. Are they dowry? Dowry, isn't it? Dowry. In my days, it used to be a very conservative idea where you only call very close friends. You also don't demand from them. They just bless you because they are friends. Nowadays, you can, you can recruit Rurashio team from Facebook and from WhatsApp. <laughs> you say, I am going to pay dowry, please. Anyone? You can even post on your website, and, and people will come. Well, these are changing times. It says, perilous times shall come. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, we were attending this uh, wedding dowry. And you know, one day we, we, we went to one, and we, were, we lifted someone. I don't know if that is English. But we gave a lift to someone we were going with. And, and we talked, because we, we knew that this guy, this guy was part of us, eh? so we, we said, when we come there, you are the spokesperson, you should be talking to them, and this is the direction, we don't want to take a lot of time, so we shall approach it this way. So we, we are speaking, but when we arrive there, this guy goes and joins the other team. <laughs> See, hey, my goodness, we, we are so wasted. This guy knows all our strategies, so, so we need to re-strategize. But the last one we went, uh, the, um, a few months ago we went, uh, Murage was there. It was so powerful because they, they are spokesperson. Usually when you're on the side of the man, you have the burden of proof, isn't it? You are the one who needs to convince the team why you need to pay what you are paying. But the others are just relaxed. The lady's part is just relaxed, isn't it? So we were on the man's side. So the burden of proof was on us. But the, their spokesperson spoke something that was so powerful. I wish all men with daughters would say that. Before we even began, he said, uh, before we begin, I want to make it very straight that you have already been given the girl and whatever wedding day you want has already been granted. Now, our discussion is not a prerequisite for our permission. You've already been granted. So we are just talking about the details. You understand? Oh, God bless such men. So we were so empowered. In fact, do you know that having said that, you become more generous. <laughs> you say, if they believe and trust in us, we should not let them down, isn't it? But you see, there are some negotiations that you do until you say, let me... Uh, come up and pull up my socks, but I'll never come back to this home again because of what you went through. You understand? So when that guy said that, it was liberating, isn't it? Now, you don't want to let him down. He has, he has had faith in you. And he believes in you. And he believes that already, no matter what, how the discussion is going to go, you already have a date because you are going to be agreeable, isn't it? That means... You, before you even start talking, your offer will be acceptable. And that is what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the poor. What Jesus is giving us in the Beatitudes or the Psalm on the Mountain are not commands, are blessing. God is blessing you to be obedient to his word. Says, I bless you. Eh? I bless you to overcome. Meaning he, 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 he sees you at the end, that is why he shows you what you are going to achieve and what you are going to gain. He says, why are the poor blessed? Because theirs is the kingdom of God. He's not, uh, he's not talking to them about where they are, but where they are going. Did you know that to help somebody, you don't add rules? Some parents think that if my child is not obedient enough, the five rules are not enough. I need to add them to be ten. And you've noticed by experience, they just become worse. Because 
when somebody uh, starts believing he cannot achieve what you are giving him, he becomes frustrated. Isn't it? When the aim is too high that cannot be achieved, so you become frustrated. And that's why some Christians have grown like that. They believe this salvation thing eh, is not for everyone. It's only for a chosen few. Because I have tried. But every time I promise, I cannot achieve it. That is the problem with the law. Read Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. What does the Bible say? That if you shall be diligent to observe all that I have commanded to you this day. It says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today. That the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And then he says, these blessings shall follow you, isn't it? But before you say, all these blessings shall fall of us too, go back to verse 1. What is the condition? He says, if you shall observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, which commandments? He say, all. Are you seeing? He say, all the commandments, not a few, not two or three. You say, hey, I've really improved. I'm now at 75%. Uh -uh. You do not qualify for these blessings. James chapter 2 verse 10. Let's see what James says. James writing about this, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is? Meaning that you either obey all or none. So you can't claim, blessed is he when I come in and when I go out. Blessed is my flower and my word. Blessed are, uh, 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 go back. Have you obeyed all? So if you have not obeyed all, <laughs> uh, save your breath. You understand? Because he says, if you stumble in one point, you are guilty. But what happens to a soul that knows I can't obey all? Because the Bible says it is the law. Without the law, there is no transgression. Because it is the law that makes you transgress. And the Bible says also it is the law that killeth. The law that killeth. Without law, there is no death. Isn't it? So, if you know, you reach a point, you know, hey, this thing, I cannot make it. You become frustrated. That's why Jesus is saying, blessed. First of all, before you do anything, you must understand, you're already blessed. Before you embark on your Christian journey and say, I will obey this and this, you must know, you are blessed. God has already blessed you. To be blessed is to be approved. And to be approved is before, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, that you are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the earth. Not chosen today, not chosen yesterday. You are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the earth. Uh, Romans 8 verse 29, he says those he called, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. See, he called you before you even knew yourself. To be conformed to his image. That means he's making you to look like himself. So, Christ has already done this. Given you the end before you begin. He has already empowered you to live a victorious Christian life. If you don't understand this, you are going to feel holy some weeks and unholy some weeks. Because you feel iwiki. At least you week in the morning. So you go to your fellowship that, that evening uh, on Friday and say, come on people, let's pray. Let's thank God. I, I feel the anointing. Why? Because you feel you've not lied. You've not taken a pen that is not yours. You've not done anything that you consider. Transgression of the law. But then the following week, now you come, you come to the fellowship and say, we need 30 minutes for repentance, brethren. <laughs> because, <laughs> because before you make your request known to God, you must be acceptable, isn't it? So you feel that you're going to take 30 minutes so that you clean yourself, so that you are acceptable. 
so that God can accept you. But if you look at the command of God, he says, you are blessed. Meaning you are already empowered to live a victorious life. If you look at uh, the current uh, modern picture of a helpless person or a poor person, is a little child, no, an infant. When you leave a, an infant on his belly or her belly, you'll find them there, isn't it? They'll be crying, but they can't turn, right? They can't turn because they don't have the muscle to turn, to carry themselves. And the mother will come and say, oh, poor thing. Because he's poor. That baby is poor, right? He can't help himself. <laughs> he can't turn. He'll be helpless. If, uh, I don't know if you've come back to the house and found him, maybe. Uh, it's only the feet that are, are up on the, on the coach. <laughs> but everything else. <laughs> so you get a shock as a parent, but he's okay. Hmm? I don't know if you've ever seen, I was staying here one time, and the mother arrived in the evening from work, and he found the baby on the rails, you know those rails, on the fourth floor, says, mom, look at me, <laughs> the mom just dropped, hmm? she came back later, <laughs> because that guy did not know the, the enormity of what he was doing, isn't it? But you see, Christ says, I have gone before you, I have seen what you are going through, and I can tell you you are blessed. You are already blessed. He said, seeing the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, seeing that we have such a high priest who is conversant with our affliction, we don't lose our hope. We don't faint. Because we have a high priest who has gone ahead of us. Romans 8, 18 say, says that for the present suffering cannot be compared to the glory that is about to be revealed. So he has gone ahead of us and seen what it requires, what pain it's going to cause, and what demand is going to, bl to place upon our life. And he say, you are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of God is theirs. So don't focus on where you are. Focus on what God has already opened your eyes to see. When somebody is wayward and miss, has no discipline, is not motivated by what they do, or they are not uh, following through your assignments, you don't sit down and say, do you know the rules are this? Do you know? No. The problem is his eyesight. You repaint the vision. You tell people, this is where we are going, people. Because it is energy, it is vision that brings energy, that brings motivation, isn't it? If people can't see it, they will not have the discipline to make it happen. That's why scripture says, where there is no vision, people won't do what? Or another version, where there is no vision, people cast off restraints. They don't have restraints, why? Not because they don't know the rules. They cast off restraint because they can't see it. But 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says, Wherefore he has given to us exceedingly great and awesome promises that we be partakers of his divine nature. His divine nature can only come upon us if we see his promise. And the promise he has given to us is that you are blessed. Come on, tell your neighbor, you are blessed. If you are poor in spirit, just like the infant, you know, I can't do nothing without God. You are helpless in yourself. If God left you for a minute on yourself, you will not move an inch. That's helplessness. It's called poverty of the spirit. And God is looking for such people who shall hunger and thirst after him. And know that I am helpless without him. Now, what Jesus is saying is very contrary to the opinion of the world today because you'd, you'd be surprised when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Does it make sense? That somebody who is seated there and the husband is dead or somebody that is seated there and the child, he has lost a child, say, blessed are you. But Jesus is saying, blessed are you because there is comfort on your way. Yeah? God is already sending you his comfort, isn't it? There is comfort on your way. So those who feel that I need to do this, anytime 
let me give you a scenario. Type A and then type B. Type A is a guy who you know in your life loves you unconditionally no matter what you do. Hmm? Are you following? Then type B is a guy who, know, who you know that you must do certain things for them to approve you or to love you. Are there those kind of people? Now, among the two people, who is it easy for you to obey? Huh? But it's not demanding. How is it easy? Huh? It's not telling you, you know yesterday you didn't do this. Huh? You know, uh, now, an another example. If you go home, a guy who never asks you for money, hmm? and uh, another guy who always reminds you, Leo jantumia kitu unafikiria nakula nini? Leo unafanya nini? To you and your heart, who do you feel it is always easier for you to give? The demanding guy or the non-demanding guy? You are a contradiction. Yeah? It only means that if we are in an environment where we know we are already loved, no matter what you do, it is easier to obey. In fact, an an, a loving environment is an empowerment to us to love. That is why if you carry religion to salvation, you'll have a big, uh, uh, a hard time because you'll know, I must do this and this and this and this for God to love me. Because you are going to feel more closer to God on these 21 days, because, sometimes because you feel now, because I've fasted enough, ah, I think I deserve it. Hmm? But the problem happens when you eat a cake and say, eh? I've just wasted my 14 days. <laughs> so if you read this verse in light of what we are doing even as a church, God is not calling us to come out, to run from, away from food. He's calling us to himself. So it's not a call from, it's a call to. Where is your eyes and your focus? Your focus should be to God, not from. Imagine we only have 10 days, 10 days more, you say, oh, 10 days of not eating again. No. Look at this this way. 10 days to focus on him. Our focus is to God. You are not focusing on what you are missing. <laughs> we were in a wedding yesterday and you've never seen chicken that has been grilled well. Hmm? <laughs> so, you look and say, hey. Hallelujah. Itaisha <laughs> too. You see, that's the wrong attitude. That you are, you are just seeing what you're missing. But you don't know what you're gaining. So Jesus is telling, ah, ah, don't worry that you're poor in spirit. There is a kingdom. Focus your eyes on the kingdom. Ah, ah, don't be overwhelmed that you're mourning or going through hardship. Ah, ah, there is comfort sent. Comfort is on the way. Hallelujah. When you are persecuted for righteousness sake, don't look around and, oh, well, yeah, because I love Jesus, that's why I'm going through. Ah, ah, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So when you are meek, that means authority. That, that, that means authority and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. You are strong in yourself, but you are kept under. The meek people are not weak. You are just under, under discipline. So when you take things and you tolerate things, don't worry that you are taking too much. No, the, the whole earth is yours. Look at what you'll inherit. So heaven is not where we are going. We are already here. You are inheriting here. How many are the, the meek here? You are <laughs> the earth is yours. <laughs> yeah? So focus on what God has already in Christ guaranteed for you. So you will not be looking at where you are. You are looking at what God has opened for you. And you are blessed. So when it comes to obedience of God and his commandments, it is not something that you are trying to do. God has already proclaimed, you have already overcome it. You have already made it. Now you are leaving the end from the beginning. 
when you enter temptation, you know I've already overcome. You are operating from a point of winning, victory. You are not trying. Huh? You are not trying to make it. And so you come uh, for prayer meeting or a service in the church and you must be lifted because where you are coming from, hey. Huh? Because the week you've walked under the, 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 the arm of the enemy and you've gone through many things and you feel dirty and filthy and so you need some cleansing. You need some water at the entry to wash yourself so that you can appear before the altar. Ah, let me give you good news. You're already blessed. And God has already accepted you. Oh, praise God. And if he has accepted me, it means now he has given me a spirit of adoption, isn't it? It says, by which we cry, Abba, Father. It's not given me the spirit of condemnation unto death, but he has given me a spirit of sonship. A son is never worried in their home. Uh -uh. We, we just hear me, unless you have a draconian father, if you broke, uh, broke something in your home, you, you don't see it, oh, it's not like I had a master. Uh uh. You say, Daddy, oh, nilikuwa na cheza hivi, nafanya hivi. Sometimes they break very heavy and, uh, you know, very expensive things. But the way they are reporting doesn't seem like expensive, isn't it? <laughs> have you had that experience? Since now, Romans 8, we have, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the, for the law of the spirit of Jesus Christ has delivered me from the law of sin and death. For that which the law, verse 3, was not able to do, in that it was weak in the flesh, God sent his son in the form of sin and death to emancipate me, to bring me out. So that now, verse 4, he says that now I might be justified in the sight of the law, not by the flesh, but by the spirit. So I have already won. Come on, tell your neighbor, you have already won. You are not trying to win. Uh -uh. You are not trying. <laughs> you know, some people also regard as the titles in church as levels of... Uh, uh, overcoming sin. Kiona ni pastor, sasa upo ni A grade. Kiona ni reverend, sasa ukiona ni bishop, and that's why they are going now for a bishop. I think they are going to get pop now. <laughs> the goodness with this verse, he was talking to ordinary disciples, ordinary believers, you and I, that you, who was saved last year, last week, last month, and somebody else who was saved 30 years, all of you are blessed. You want to get on your, on your feet? We want to make a prayer as we close. And you want to speak. You want to speak to yourself until God has no problem. He already understands it. There are things that God speaks to us not not. Not for himself. When God was saying, asking Adam, where are you? It was not for God. It was for Adam to find out where he was. God knew where he was. You want to speak to yourself, God, I know I am blessed. I'm blessed to live a victorious Christian life. I am blessed to overcome. I'm blessed to inherit the kingdom. No matter what I'm going through. Eh? Well, no matter what you're going through whether it's mourning or persecution you say God bless I am blessed because comfort is on the way I'm blessed because I hang after uh, and thirst after righteousness because I shall inherit the kingdom I shall see God hallelujah you speak you know there are things that God has already told us but we are telling him you're saying, God, please stop the gift in me. Oh, Father, my God. And we spend one hour. God has said, you stop the gift in you. You. Huh? Stop. <laughs> so open your mouth in a minute and say, God, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And customize it for yourself. Say, no matter what I'm going, this thing I'm going through, there's a place for you. If I'm mourning right now, I am blessed. Oh Lord, I'm blessed in the name of Jesus. I am blessed. Those who are persecuted are blessed.
Those who hunger and thirst of righteousness, they are blessed in the name of Jesus.